where there has to be space. Okay, everyone. Um, I'm excited uh, today to talk to you about uh, QTS Hero. Um, QTS Hero is QTS with the ZFS file system. And we are marketing this for performance-driven video, uh, video editing and also other enterprise use cases. And that's because ZFS actually has some features that can significantly help with performance. I know ZFS has a reputation for the compression, for storing more data, protecting, protecting your data, keeping it safe. And you may not know as much, at least hear as much about the performance benefits, but there's actually some significant performance benefits to ZFS as well. And so I'll be talking about that today and why it's really good for video editors who want more simultaneous editors editing off the NAS before they hit you know, throughput limitations and also just better storage utilization. <laughs> All right. Space isn't. Okay, so uh, for our agenda today, we'll talk about what is QTS Hero um, and kind of some supported models of it. <clears throat> so first of all, a brief uh, a history of our OS. In 2009, we had our Turbo NAS uh, firmware, uh, three point whatever. And then 2013, we went to QTS 4. So we're currently still in QTS 4. We know we're at 4.4.1. And then in 2015, we came out with QES, and QES uses the ZFS file system. However, up till now, if you want ZFS, you have to sacrifice the App Center, right? The App Center has more than 100 apps. There's so many amazing features on QTS that you have to sacrifice if you want ZFS. So now, at the end of this year, we intend to have QTS Hero, QTS, all those rich features with ZFS. So whenever we design an OS, we want to think about what kind of drives you might use. Because we want to get you the best performance possible with the drives you use, and we want the best storage utilization, and we want the drives to last. And so we think about this whenever we design an operating system, how can we use those drives effectively? And ZFS has a lot of features that can help you get better performance um, out of the drives you have, and also store more in your drives. So as far as what is QTS Hero, it's, it's uh, QTS, but because of ZFS, it has better data integrity. For example, uh, self-healing, you know, protection from silent data corruption, uh, better storage protection, whether that be uh, more snapshots, or whether it be the ability to, to support triple parity, the ability to lose three drives and keep your data. And uh, we get that without sacrificing uh, the many uh, features on QTS. So with QTS Hero, you get data self-healing. Um, you get uh, more than 65,000 snapshots. That's because ZFS supports snapshots natively, and that's why you can have more. Uh, you still have a virtualization station. And of course, we're still, you know, work great with VMware, Hyper-V, all that. And just all QNAPs are great for unified storage. And uh, ZFS has some features that help with flash endurance, uh, not to mention uh, flash performance. <clears throat> so some highlights of QTS Hero is uh, data efficiency. We offer inline deduplication and compression. Inline means you deduplicate before you write to the drives. And it's the before you write to the drives that's going to lead to better performance. I'll explain that later. We offer more advanced cache, uh, better data protection, uh, whether that be more snapshots or just safer raids like triple parity. Um, data integrity, you know, protection from silent uh, data corruption. Uh, system stability, um, you know, uh, for example, if a drive uh, fails, I think everyone's fear is that what if one drive fails and then during the raid rebuild, what if another drive fails? Well, ZFS can rebuild a lot faster, so it's, you're a lot less likely to lose a drive uh, during raid rebuild. Um, and we still have all our apps. So let's talk about data efficiency. Really? 
Okay, um, so this is the, the ZFS storage pool design. Um, so something that's different is with QTS, right, you have your storage pool, and then you have your, your volumes on top of the pool, and then you have your folders on top of the volumes. Well, in ZFS, you just have your share folders right on top of the pool. So you cut out a layer. And, and that, could, that actually has some potential benefit to performance cutting off a layer. <clears throat> And so share folder and LUN are on the same layer. So uh, ZFS offers inline compression and deduplication, and um, that could save you a lot of space. Uh, it really depends what kind of file you're using. Sometimes it's huge amounts of space savings, sometimes it's smaller amounts, um, but it, it can be a lot. And um, with every share folder, you can uh, turn these features on and off to compression, deduplication, cache. You can turn these features on and off at any time just with a click. So very easy to turn on and off. And we support the LZ4 uh, compression. So that's a very good level of compression and it's a very fast, uh, high performance. And compression is going to help you get higher performance. And we support inline deduplication. So we support compression and deduplication. And it's important that we support both because certain types of files will benefit a lot from compression but not benefit much from deduplication. Other kinds of files will benefit greatly from deduplication but not as much from compression. So um, yeah, we, we have both. And so, uh, so deduplication is basically, as I mentioned uh, uh, before, if you have multiple groups of blocks that are the same, you can just combine them. So kind of turn that into that. And so there's obvious storage capacity benefits. Think of video editors who are, you know, having terabytes of raw data every week, how much money you're going to pay, and how much money you can save uh, with compression. Uh, for video editing, probably compression's the one that's going to be a bigger deal. But um, whatever your files are, if you can compress it or deduplicate it, you can save space, therefore save money. Also, uh, this can make our caching feature more effective because we compress it and deduplicate it before we write it to the SSD cache. And that means, uh, rather than put that big block in the cache, put the small, the small one in the cache. You can cache more data. Because you know, you want cache hits, you don't want cache misses. So your cache becomes more effective. One uh, word of caution though, is that um, our deduplication requires a lot of RAM. We recommend one gigabyte of RAM for every one terabyte of deduplicated data. And so that is very important. Um, if you want to use deduplication, you better have a lot of RAM. Uh, the reason we need that is because whenever you read a file, you have to convert that into that. And in order to make that conversion, you need metadata. And we keep the metadata in the RAM. We don't want to have to wait to fetch it from the drives, because then there could be a performance cost. We don't want a performance cost, so we keep the metadata in the RAM so that we can convert that into that very quickly. Is there a question? <clears throat> in an environment where you have high availability with another unit, what are, what are the inline deduplication advantages for sending it from a host to a target? Well, um, you know, I, in like two slides, I'm going okay, to get to that. Yep. Um, yeah. No. No, we have inline dedupe. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so basically, I think what's going on is that we want people to know how are you different than BTRFS because Synology would say, oh, BTRFS is so good and it has some good things. I'm not going to diss it too bad, but uh, ZFS has the benefits of BTRFS and a whole lot more. Bob loves Synology. So, <laughs> so yeah, you can turn any of these features on or off at any time. And this is important because uh, for the video editors out there, Compression will probably help you a lot, 
and deduplication would probably do almost nothing for you. And the deduplication takes a lot of RAM. So if RAM's an issue in your video editor, probably turn off dedupe, keep on compression. But on the other hand, if you have a lot of VM images, that deduplication might help a huge amount. And so you probably want that on. So you can know, just know what to turn on, what to turn off. And I want to say as a pre-sale support person, if you don't know or your customer doesn't know which features should be turned on, call us, email us. We're very happy to tell you, yeah, for your use case, use compression. For the, your use case, use deduplication. We're happy to advise on the right configuration and help you advise your customers on the right configuration. So um, this uh, uh, deduplication and compression can help your SSDs last longer. And for an obvious reason, you write less to your SSDs, right? SSDs have a limited number of writes. So you don't, you don't write that to the SSDs, you write that to the SSDs. You write less, the SSDs last longer. So let's just get into how our deduplication, compression, and compaction work. So when you write uh, to the NAS, that goes into the RAM. While it's in the RAM, you uh, compress it. So you turn that big, you know, uh, blue block into the smaller, right? Compressed. But sometimes after compression, there are some blank uh, spaces. Basically, you write to SSD blocks or HDD sectors, and there could be some blank spaces. And that's bad for performance, right? You don't want to write to half of one block, half of another block. And then when you read the data, you have to read it from two blocks. You probably cut your performance in half. So next, we compact. And so we compress, dedupe, and compact while it's in the RAM before you write to the drives. So that means you write less data to the drives, and you can just write to the drives quicker, read from the drives quicker because of this. And I, I want to talk, I think here's where I'm going to talk about why uh, this is so good for performance, why we uh, market this to video editors. Uh, consider this. Under normal conditions, you cannot write to the NAS faster than you can write to the drives, right? So a typical HDD drive, maybe you write from it or read from it 200 megabytes a second, maybe. Now, we don't want to be stuck at 200 megabytes a second, so we put drives in a RAID and stripe your data. So maybe you have a RAID group that can let you read or write from it at 1,000 megabytes a second. Under normal conditions, then, the limitation would be you cannot write to the NAS more than 1,000 megabytes a second. But consider this now. What you write to the drives is not that big amount up top. It's the small amount after you compress and dedupe. So in other words, if, you can, if after compression you can write to the drives at 1,000 megabytes a second, then before compression maybe that's 1,500 megabytes a second. So when the drives are the limiting factor in how fast you can write to the NAS, you can write to the NAS faster. So you have maybe 25G, 40G. Maybe you have 1,500 megabytes per second coming into the NAS while you write at 1,000 megabytes a second to your drive RAID group. So when the drives are the bottleneck, this can greatly help with performance. And most of the time, the drives are uh, like the main bottleneck. So this makes it great for video editing for performance because, you know, People start out their video editing studios and they say, okay, two to three editors at once is fine. Then they grow. Like, well, can I have four or five editors at once? And what are we going to do when we go to 8K, right? People are editing 4K, but what do you do when you go to 8K? How much throughput are you going to need? You know, there's things we can do, right? We can start editing compressed video instead of raw video. We can edit by proxy. There are things we can do to try to get by. But when you go to 8K, you're going to wish you had more throughput. Not to mention the cost of storing, it's already too expensive storing 4, 4K, the cost of storing 8K video, how much will that cost? If you can compress it, you can save so much money. So that, like in this example, um, we have 800 gigabytes of data after compression, maybe 400 gigabytes, after deduplication, 300 gigabytes. But you know, how much these features help greatly depends on what kind of files you have. So let's talk more about performance. Another advantage for performance with a ZFS is the more advanced uh, cache. So uh, in this chart, we have our ARC cache. That is using RAM as cache. You know, RAM is extremely fast. Um, now there's a downside to RAM, though, is that RAM is not persistent. You lose power, RAM loses the data. So what we also have is ZIL logging. 
so when you uh, use RAM as cache, you log it on the Zill. So if you lose power, this can protect you from data corruption or, or you can have a log of what was there. This can protect you from loss or corruption. And that makes it safer to use RAM as a cache. Now, you might, might ask, well, doesn't QTS also in some ways use RAM as a cache? Well, well, well yes, in a way. Uh, uh, Linux does support caching through RAM. But when, when uh, Linux, and we're Linux-based, but, but when you use kind of the, the Linux-based one, you have less control over it. You don't have the Zill logging. Uh, you're not getting to hold it in the RAM while you compress and dedupe and coalesce before you write it, write it. So you're not getting nearly as much benefit from using RAM like a cache uh, in, in normal QTS. But ZFS gives you a lot more control. And so while it's in that RAM, RAM cache, we can you know, compress it before we write it. And we have the Zill login to make it so much safer. So this is really a much better cache. And then we have the, the uh, L, L2ARC, which is SSD read cache. And, but, but keep in mind, because RAM is a cache, this is one of the reasons why you should have a lot of RAM if you want to use this feature. That, you know, if you want to really benefit from what QTS Hero has to offer, get a lot of RAM. Uh, just any questions so far? Everybody good? like 128 gigs of RAM or even more than that, 256 gigs of RAM on a TS1683XURP, which is like a top of the line model for QNAP, 64 gigs of RAM is as high as you can go. So if I'm going to have, you said get a certain amount per terabyte, if I'm going to have 200 terabytes on a system and I can only put a maximum of 64 gigs of RAM into a TS1683, what do I do? Well, since I think you mostly advise video editors, I would say use compression, and it uses less RAM than deduplication. And I, you might be okay. Um, I, does anyone here know exactly how much RAM the compression needs? Anyone want to answer that? Here we have a recommendation uh, model uh, after the uh, entire uh, presentation. But however, uh, it just affects on the performance. So uh, the catch itself, uh, no need to uh, put everything into the catch. Yeah, but still depends on the write pattern, depends on the rewrite pattern. So uh, we recommend at least uh, 8 gigabyte memory for those operations, but better to have more than a 16. I think it would be great since larger RAM chips are available yeah. that QNAP starts supporting larger RAM chips inside these products. Yes, exactly. Because uh, it's just like, like uh, ES series is uh, only uh, storage. It's an application server, actually. So we still need to have a memory to run the uh, virtual machines, have a, uh, containers, dockers, well, a lot. So uh, still depends on application. If it's just uh, storage, then uh, we can have a minimum requirement. But if you like to have more applications, still rely on what kind of application. So it's kind of balanced. But w uh, actually, we cannot give you a calculator to see. <laughs> Uh, how big volume and uh, how uh, how many applications you like to run and the, how many memory you need to reserve because uh, it's totally uh, reflect to the access pattern uh, small IO, big IO, sequential, random yeah so maybe you are thinking uh, we're not uh, <laughs> answering your question uh, directly but still it's really a complex question okay thank you So Daniel, mm -hmm. I think I'm kind of concerned about the risk mitigation of putting data in RAM. Um, I understand that the only um, the only explanation so far has been uh, to ensure that there's no data loss within the RAM environment when there's a failure, is to write to the Zill, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Zill logs whatever in the in the RAM for okay. cache. Now, <coughs> the Zill, as far as your particular uh, presentations concern showed SSDs. Mm -hmm. um, still feel that the risk mitigation is a little bit high for writing so much into the RAM, because if we're still discussing about having so much RAM, um, the type of data that goes into the RAM before compression is still a, I don't think the risk mitigation is very uh, suitable, so to speak. 
for data loss? So is ZIL the only way that it writes to to protect that? So uh, maybe I'll let someone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, we, are, uh, we also discuss this a lot uh, in internally. Yeah, because uh, previous years models, I think you also see there exists a BBU layer. Yeah, it uh, need to preserve uh, the the cache uh, right. inside right. the memory. Yeah, but for uh, QTS Hero, uh, it uh, target on the mid range of the 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 storage. Ah, okay, yeah. that's different. Yes. Because currently, if this, this wouldn't be fantastic in a, a dual controller ES1686 because of memory limitation. Yeah, so uh, for ES series, it will still continue and uh, target for the mission critical application. Okay, I, I think you've explained. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions out there? Everybody good? Oh, no. one more. Just out of curiosity, uh, have you guys ever thought about just putting a battery backup on your RAM? I mean, our ES does that. Um, so, I mean, so far for QTS Hero, I guess we don't have it. Our ES has a battery backup for this very reason. Yeah. So uh, for QTS Hero, it's target on, on the uh, existing uh, hardware, uh, which is uh, similar to uh, the TS series. So that's why we uh, provide a migration pass Actually, data not migrated, but the same, uh, same how it can be uh, converted from the QTS to a QTS Hero. But that means uh, the extra protection on the BBU is not available for those uh, entry level or middle range of uh, NAS devices. Yeah. So uh, if uh, the, the memory cache or uh, even the data con consistent integrity is really uh, is important, uh, we will still recommend to use the ES series. Can you set that, I mean, are there levels of cache that you can set up like right through and right back or you guys just go ahead and take care of that transparently? Yeah, we, we definitely can uh, set it into right through, but uh, it hurt the, the uh, right performance, of course. And I might add that, you know, you can always get a, a UPS so that you're less likely to, to lose anything in your RAM from a power outage. Great. Uh, software that it indicates that you now have a power loss in your building and you go and wind up losing everything, that in addition to now starting an auto shutdown after that period of time, that the minute that that indicates a power loss, that SSD cache should now be written onto the drive so that you don't lose that cache. It seems like we don't have to do very much other than saying, all right, the minute we see notification from the UPS, as long as you've got that USB cable plugged in, we're gonna wind up now writing that information so that you don't lose anything. Uh, chip, then you're gonna lose. Yeah, that's the only concern, yeah? So uh, we hear your concern. So I will say for, for, for video editing, um, you know, it, it's not like you lose everything. I mean, it, it's a little bit, a little small amounts in your RAM, right, as you're editing. So but you might lose like a little bit of work, but it's, it's not going to destroy you if you lost what was in the RAM for most of, of what we're recommending this for. And this really can help a lot with performance. But yes, you could set the, uh, we call it right through, so I mean, if you if you don't want to use this, um, you don't have to. But I think for video editors, that this will help a lot. And I think you're not risking much for video editing because uh, you're not risking losing much for video editing. So I, I'm actually not done talking about performance. Um, we have another performance enhancing feature: uh, right coalescing. And so what write coalescing does is we take a bunch of random writes, hold them in the RAM, and then write them sequentially as 256K blocks. And you might think 256K is not very much. And um, I don't know if anyone just laughed at 256K, but there's a reason why it's 256K. And that is because um, SSD blocks 
will be a, a multiple of 256K. So whether it's two or four or six, it, it'll, it'll, 256K will go into an SSD block evenly. And so for example, if it was just, if it was just 240K, what would happen is you might fill up 90% of an SSD block. And then next time you write, you have to like write the other 10% of this block and 80% of the other. You, you, that would be bad for performance. But when you coalesce to 256K, that will go evenly into an SSD block, which ensures that you write to the whole block. And when you write to the whole block, the SSD lasts longer and you get better performance. So actually, as much as 256K sounds small, we've seen as much as I think a tripling in IOPS through write coalescing. And part of that is, is that it, you'll write to the whole block very efficiently. And so all these features, whether it be the inline compression or the right coalescing, um, can help you have more simultaneous uh, video editors because you could get more throughput into the NAS and that could be, be more editors. And um, even if you think you can, your current NAS can handle enough editors now, I mean, when we go to 8K, you, you might want more. And so um, I'm very excited to talk about this, this product because of the performance gains as well as being able to store more on your NAS with the drives you have. But uh, let's talk now about uh, data protection. So let's go away from performance for a while. Uh, a lot of people like ZFS uh, for the data protection. Um, so we offer you know, RAID 0, RAID 1. Uh, RAID Z1 is basically RAID 5 with ZFS. RAID Z2 is basically RAID 6. But we also support RAID Z3, triple parity. So you could lose three drives and still uh, keep your data. And we support you know, RAID 10, 50, and 60. But that triple parity is a very safe RAID. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, because uh, the right of data, uh, of course, uh, more secure, just like we compare with uh, RAID 5 and RAID 6 before. So uh, it will have extra uh, the parity need to be uh, spread. So if uh, you get less uh, hard drives, and uh, it will uh, have uh, more uh, overhead. But if you have already have maybe more than eight, uh, hard drives in parallel in this pool, then uh, it's, it should be okay to uh, uh, separate those uh, overhead to a lot of hard drives. Yeah, and especially uh, for the SSD, it's, uh, it can also be better because it uh, reduces the sick, sick time uh, between those uh, updating those parity uh, drives. Some uh, performance data, and uh, we can send out uh, after the, the, the event. Yeah, it's test in the uh, lab in Taiwan. Thank you. So aside from supporting triple parity uh, for more safety, let's talk about some of the other uh, benefits. Uh, more snapshots, right? 65,000, instead of being limited to you know, 256 per volume. So, uh, you know, give yourself more restore points in case you get ransomware or attacks or accidental deletions or whatever. And the way you manage the snapshots in QTS here was pretty much the same as how you manage in QTS, so it shouldn't be hard to learn. And then something else we have uh, is called Worm, write once, read uh, many. Uh, this is really about... Um, it's about, it's not about protecting yourself from corruption or, or drive failure, but it, what it is about is being able to prove that what you have is what you originally submitted. So what it does is it allows you to write to the NAS, and then it will not let you modify it. So if someone says, you know, you wrote this to me six months ago, and then you read off the NAS, and it says, it doesn't say that, I'm like, and you're like, well, but it did say that six months ago. You changed it. Well, um, you can prove you didn't change it because you write once, then you can't modify. Some people need this for compliance. Some people just want to be able to protect themselves, be able to prove that, yes, this is what I wrote six months ago. 
Let's talk about data integrity. Protection from bit write, you know, silent data corruption. So this is a feature that ZFS has. And just for those of you who are using the original QTS, the way we deal with this is we can schedule a bad block check. I think typically now we, we schedule it every month. So it's, it's not like we're, you're control, totally you know, screwed if you don't have this, but ZFS in real time catches and fixes silent data corruption. So you don't have to do a bad block check, but just immediately, real time, ZFS corrects this. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, basically something goes wrong over time, very gradual typically, but if it happens silently, you don't know about it, and if you're not running bad block scans, eventually some serious corruption could happen if you're not uh, checking for this. But ZFS doesn't have to check for this. It just checks for it. And basically with ZFS, um, you have um, a checksum for each block. So if there is a bit of corruption, basically the sum of the block doesn't match the checksum. Immediately, ZFS knows there's, there's a problem. No bad block check required. Immediately, because we have checksums for each block, immediately we know there's a problem. And then we immediately heal from the problem. So when I explain how we heal from the problem, I'm going to explain it with RAID 1 just because it's easier. But I assure you this works great with RAID 5, RAID, whatever your RAID is, this works. It's just easier to explain with RAID 1. So with RAID 1, you've got two drives in a mirror. What's on one drive is on the other drive, right? So then obviously you've got to check some doesn't match. There's a problem. A block has been corrupted. It's simple, actually. You uh, have the same block on the good drive, right? You read the good block from the good drive and you transfer now the good block to the bad drive. So you've detected, the, you've detected the corruption and you've fixed the corruption and it does it immediately in real time. And, this will, and you basically just use your RAID redundancy to get the good block. And it works whatever RAID you choose as long as it's not RAID zero. <clears throat> so uh, because uh, of this and just because we have our checksums, no need to um, do the check file system. You probably all experienced, you, you do an improper shutdown on a NAS. Next time you turn it on, it says, you know, you should run check file system. You don't need that uh, with ZFS. So let's uh, talk about, oh, any questions so far? So let's talk about a system stability, um, specifically RAID rebuild times. You know, on QTS, as drives get larger, RAID rebuild starts to take longer, and it, it can become an issue sometimes. Um, and I think the biggest fear is, you know, what if I have RAID 5, a drive fails, and then during RAID rebuild, what if another drive fails? That's what you don't want to ever happen. Well, uh, ZFS rebuilds faster. First of, all, first of all, with ZFS, you don't have to rebuild the whole drive when the drive fails. You only have to rebuild the portion of the drive that actually contained data. So if the drive is mostly empty when it fails, this rebuild could happen in a matter of minutes. But if the drive... By drive, you still got to write that information back, even if only one little tiny portion failed. You've still got to write that information well, back. You have to write the information back. But so, if the 16 terabyte drive is full of 16 terabytes, yes, you are rebuilding 16 terabytes. If the 16 terabyte drive is full of one terabyte, you rebuild one terabyte. And so, if the drive is mostly is, is mostly empty, it could be a matter of minutes. If the drive is uh, full, um, well, it won't be a matter of minutes, but actually even when the drive is full, ZFS is significantly faster at rebuilding than uh, QTS. So even when the drive is full, instead of it taking take two days, it'll take hours, not days, typically. <clears throat> so uh, whether it be QTS Hero or not, uh, we've partnered with Ulink to... Uh, uh, AI powered uh, to detect when we think a drive is about to fail. It'd be great if you could replace a drive right before it fails, right? So that's what we're working on. And that, that's not QTS Hero only, right? And so I, um, we're kind of behind schedule, so we're probably not going to uh, do that live demo right now. But we're just mentioning uh, that, you know, you still have all the same rich um, user experiences. Um, as you did with QTS, with QTS Hero. And something we've actually added is we have, we, we integrate with uh, Windows ACL permissions. So, um, you know, typically for a folder, you can have deny access, read only, read write. Well, look at all these permission options you have. Full control, tri 
Anyway, I'm not going to read them all, but uh, you can have very specialized uh, Windows ACL permissions that we support on the NAS. We still have the App Center, which means we, we still have File Station. We still have some of the apps that, that we're excited to talk about, like Hybrid Mount, you know, VJ by Cloud. Um, we can run virtual machines in our virtualization station. We still have all those apps, all these features that are great. And whether, you know, whether it's QTS, QES, or QTS here, we support ICER for a very low latency uh, connection, great for virtualization environment. So basically, we support all these great things that you're used to. And I don't need to really explain them all because you know, we've been supporting them. We still do, and they work great on QTS Hero as well as the rest of our models. So let's talk about some of the models that we might recommend um, for uh, QTS Hero. Um, you want a NAS that supports a decent amount of RAM. Um, and so these both support up to 64 gig. And for, for most applications, I think that should be fine. Because um, I know video editors probably want more than 64 terabytes, but video editors are using probably compression, not deduplication. So I still think this will be good for them. The, the minimum requirement is actually teeny. It's like uh, 4 gigs of RAM. And then if you want to use uh, deduplication, it's 8 gigs of RAM. But if you want to have significant data deduplicated, don't go with the minimum requirement. So uh, it's also good to have a good CPU because, you know, um, since we are compressing and deduplicating before we write to the drives, that removes the drives as the bottleneck, but the CPU is doing that, right? So this can greatly enhance your performance as long as your CPU is good. So Ryzen, right, 77 series, Ryzen NAS, up to 18 core, sorry, up to 8 core, 16 thread, uh, or a Xeon processor on the 83 series. So it's, it's best with a good unit. Um, but, you know, you could, you could consider um, tower or rack mount, and you could consider a lower-end models, but these features work especially well when you've got a good CPU and, and good amount of RAM. And here's where it says, yeah, the 4 gigabytes minimum, um, 8 gigabyte minimum for dedupe. But if you want it to work well, I, I recommend more. Um, if you already have a QTS and you want to install QTS Hero, you, you do have to, to re basically reinitialize. So, you know, cut, you know, cut, you can use Hyper Backup Sync, copy your data to another NAS, and then you can copy it back. <clears throat> and so that's QTS Hero, and I, yeah. Yes, Hero. I mean, when you first turn it on, is there going to be a choice between, oh, we want to use ZFS or we want to use, uh, the conventional QTS. Is that how it works? Sorry. Yes, uh, it, uh, it uh, except the, the dedicated model. Uh, the others, uh, when you install a QTS Hero, uh, you can uh, actually, it will definitely uh, initialize with the CFS. And uh, if you uh, want to uh, convert it back to, actually change back to QTS, then you need to upgrade to the Q QTS uh, operating system. Then all the data need to be reinitialized. So, at, but out of the box, when you first buy a new system, it's going to say, you know, do you want to initialize? And so, what is that? A, is there a plan yet, or it's still too new to? Uh, the, the, uh, QTS no, no. Hero and the QTS Hero and the ZFS are together. Yes, so you change the up operating system. If I'm you, saying when you first take it out of the box. Yeah, that's what I was yeah, you first take it out of the box. You now put, plug your drives in, you turn the power on, thing comes up you know, from QFinder, you're going to start. How do you choose between QTS uh, and Actually, starting from uh, QTS 441, there will be a button in the uh, uh, lower right of the user interface. Right. Yeah, and uh, when uh, press it, then uh, the, it can uh, purchase the license from the uh, license store, then uh, install the QTS Hero. Then uh, before that, you need to back up all your data out. Right. Then uh, it convert to QTS Hero, then you copy your data back. From what you're describing, it seems like this is going to be fantastic, provided it works as what's being described right now. Um, so it's great. When you SSH into, because I don't know ZFS, 
when you SSH into this, this is not the Linux command set. This is going to be something different, right? Uh, it's still Linux command set. It Linux system, still Linux system. Yeah, but different underlying files. files What's that? Is, yeah, it's free BSD, so it's a different no, command structure. No, it's not free BSD. It's Linux. CFS on Linux. Okay, okay. Yeah, but uh, the different thing is there is a layer called violent, there is no more violent. It's just poor than share folder. Somebody that has a huge uh, data storage system, like maybe 80 terabytes or 120 terabytes, they need to, they need to save that data elsewhere, then convert to QTS he yeah, it Hero, and then bring it back, right? I think it's, yeah, but I, I don't think we'll be in a position to tell customers to upgrade, because that'd be a nightmare. Right? Yeah. Yes, yes, we, uh, we have a, a lot of live broadcasting and we make it as a tutorial to let you know how to do that. Just like uh, Daniel, the demo, just uh, yeah. uh, uh, the HBS. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it will, uh, we can use a hybrid beta sync uh, to synchronize from the old NAS to a new one or use the uh, TR series or uh, the coming external enclosure with big capacity, then copy everything out. Then, because uh, we try to find, but there is no direct way to convert the oh, files. Because it's, it's two different file systems completely. So, yeah. I think it should be very clear that end users don't get the perception that they can upgrade. Right? That's going to be quite important. Mm, yeah. Because otherwise, they'll just be calling the same way we can convert. No, you can't. Yeah, so, so yeah. the safe yeah. way is copy It's out. very important. Yeah, copy. Or they could try themselves without even asking. So that, that could be quite disastrous. Mm. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions? Any questions out there? Folks? So I, mean, I, I think it was conveyed, but maybe I didn't put, convey as clearly as I could in my presentation. There will be some kind of licensing, and the price is not yet set. But there will be some kind of license. Yeah. I think what one time, right? But, well, <laughs> Not yet. All right, folks, any other questions out there? ETA? No, ETA, uh, actually, we are debugging on, on some, uh, especially the license part and also some uh, performance fine tune. So, our ETA uh, is uh, next month. End of next month. Yeah. Mm, not sure. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, we, we will try our best because uh, the quality is still number one. We, we don't want to. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. But uh, still, we like to keep the, the quality. Otherwise, uh, because it's related. Thank you. All right, folks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.